Hello, my name is Glenn Andrea. I'm a film historian and filmmaker. And today we're going to be talking about one of my favorites, Marlena Dietrich. Marlena Dietrich was born in Germany in December 1901. And she had a pretty decent childhood. She was living middle class. Uh, however, by the time Marlena was turning 17, uh, Germany had just lost World War I. The German dollar just really lost value. The economy just absolutely crashed. The movies were one of the few thriving industries in Germany at the time uh, because the whole world wanted to see these new German films like The Cabinet of Dr. Caligari or Fritz Lang's Dr. Mabuse. So show business was the way to go. So Marlene Dietrich became a chorus girl in the early 1920s and her first real film appearance was a bit part in a 1923 film The Little Napoleon. It was on a movie set where she met her future husband Rudolf Siebler and they married in May of 1923 and her only daughter Maria was born on December 13th 1924. Marlena Dietrich worked both in Berlin and Vienna on silent films during the mid-1920s and she never really liked these films. Here is her last silent film, The Ship of Lost Men, made 1929, a year before her breakthrough film, The Blue Angel. And it's rather haphazardly directed by Maurice Tenor, who normally was a top director in the silent era. And it's very uncharacteristic for Marlena. She's a damsel in distress something she would never play in films. Around the same time she's making The Ship of Lost Men, she gets the attention of an American director, Joseph von Sternberg, who's in Germany to make a film, The Blue Angel. Now, Sternberg had uh, created a great reputation for himself in Hollywood, making really wonderful films like Underworld and The Last Command. The Blue Angel is a, just a very gripping film about the downfall of this once proud high school teacher played by Emil Jannings. He finds out his students at night are going to this nightclub, the Blue Angel. And this is the teacher's and pretty much the world's first view of Marlena Dietrich. It's uh, the perfect pairing. It's Dietrich's sexuality with Joseph von Sternberg's incredible vision. He does not make the Blue Angel nightclub a very inviting place. She's going to bring down this stuffy professor and she's going to have a ball doing it. The Blue Angel was a co-production between UFA Studios and Hollywood's Paramount Pictures. In fact, they had an English language version of the Blue Angel made. Here it is where Emily Yannings is really struggling with English and Marlena Dietrich is just smooth as silk. How do you like my eyes? You don't like them, huh? We are doch uh, uh, beautiful. Your temper seems to have improved since yesterday. I'm afraid I was a little uh, excited. You might have scared me to death. Emily Yannings was something of an egomaniac. He had already won an Academy Award in Hollywood. And he didn't like all the attention that uh, everybody and Joseph von Sternberg was giving Marlena Dietrich. So he'd throw these like temper tantrums on the set and one time he was threatening to strangle her. Now the night that the Blue Angel premiered in Berlin in 1930, Marlena Dietrich boarded an ocean liner to go to Hollywood to start a, a Hollywood career with Paramount Pictures and director Joseph von Sternberg. Adolf Zucker, the head of Paramount Pictures, wanted all these publicity pictures of Marlena Dietrich, but in these like very ladylike, sort of cheesecakey poses. She decides she's going to have pictures taken in pantsuits. Something that was like unheard of for a woman in 1930 America. 
Morocco, made in 1930, was her first Hollywood film, and she's working opposite uh, one of the biggest leading men at the time, Gary Cooper. The film not only earns her an Academy Award nomination, but a lot of gasps from middle America. <laughs> the success of uh, Morocco with Dishonored, a sort of Mata Harry story. Uh, figure Paramount at the time found out that MGM was going to do a film version of Mata Harry with Greta Garbo, so they had to rush out their own with their own female sensation, Marlene Dietrich. Dishonored's a tremendous hit, and Marlene Dietrich fans are just streaming across America. Dietrich and von Sternberg would score a bigger hit the next year with Shanghai Express. Uh, many critics call this Grand Hotel on Wheels. Dietrich herself was learning cinematography, and she had enough star power in 1932 where she can actually tell the cinematographer, uh, use that really strong light on me. So, you know, you have a set lit at about a thousand foot candles. Dietrich is going to be lit at 1,100 foot candles. It creates a spotlight effect that she really doesn't need a close-up. Later that year, von Sternberg and Dietrich would work on Blonde Venus. We now look at Blonde Venus as a really eccentric, wild film, especially where Dietrich plays a uh, cabaret singer who appears in a very weird costume. I like the one dancing girl in the back helping with the costume. Audiences in 2020 are still gasping when they see Dietrich come out of the ape costume. It's a really beautifully shot film, but it was a box office disaster. Paramount's thinking, okay, she's doing all of her films with Josef von Sternberg. Let's give her another director. So they give Dietrich over to Ruben Mamalian, who's doing very inventive uh, films such as Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde and the musical Love Me Tonight. And they do a romantic tragedy called Song of Songs. And this gets church groups and censors all in a dither because in one scene, her character is posing nude for an artist. And it's all implied. Now there's this story that on the first day of filming Song of Songs, Marlena Dietrich yells out to Ruben Mamolian, Ruben, where is my mirror? And he's asking, well, what mirror? And she says, my own special mirror I use in my dressing room. It has lights and cables and I need my own mirror. So they had to go get her mirror. She would do two more films for Joseph von Sternberg, um, The Scarlet Empress in 1934, and The Devil is a Woman in 1935. Um, here she is with uh, future Joker, Cesar Romero. Now there's a problem with The Devil is a Woman. It takes place in Spain, but it paints a very unfavorable uh, picture of the Spanish people. So when the film was first shown in Spain, there was such an uprising in that country. A Spanish government threatened, you pull the devils of women from all markets worldwide, from all theaters, or you can never release another film in Spain again. And Paramount was making a lot of money off of the Spanish market, so they agreed. The Devil is a Woman almost became a lost film, and how it resurfaced was that a uh, print was found in Marlena Dietrich's own collection. More so than the problem Paramount is having with Spain, the world is beginning to have a problem with Adolf Hitler. And there's a lot of refugees that just want to get out of Germany and come to America. Uh, so in the late 1930s, Marlena Dietrich along with her friend, uh, writer, soon-to-be director, Billy Wilder, they created a fund to get a lot of artists and refugees out of Germany 
and to America. And it was later on that um, Adolf Hitler wanted Marlene Dietrich to come back to Germany and become the first lady of Third Reich cinema. And she just flat out said, no, I think Adolf Hitler is a total fool and an idiot. Marlene Dietrich uh, made a deal with producer Alexander Korda that she would appear in the adventure film Night Without Armor, uh, opposite star Robert Donat, uh, providing that Korda has von Joseph von Sternberg direct the big epic I, Claudius. Dietrich completed Night Without Armor, however, the female lead of I, Claudius, Merle Oberon, suffered a car accident, so they had to shut down production of that film. It was Joseph von Sternberg that encouraged Marlene Dietrich to uh, take on the uh, role in Destry Rides Again as the saloon singer Frenchie. Destry Rides Again would be a tremendous success for Dietrich. Her uh, career was sort of fading at the time. And she kind of felt she wanted to do something very patriotic, very pro-American. And what's more American than a Western? There's stories that she had an affair with her Destry Rides Again star, James Stewart, and that she also had an affair with uh, Joseph Kennedy. Uh, one of her lesser known films, and it's actually quite a good film, is Manpower, uh, where she works with director Ralph Walsh, who absolutely enjoyed working with her. Here she is with co-star George Raft. Uh, George Raft is of German descent. In between takes, Raft would talk to uh, Dietrich in German, and she resented this. <laughs> Of inciting and exciting a riot, of being a public nuisance. I make rough seas. I set the jungle on fire. I'm a bad influence. <laughs> After the attack on Pearl Harbor, uh, Dietrich was one of the first uh, movie stars to help sell war bonds for the war effort, and she went on a lot of USO tours. You know, the USO, she did some magic shows with Orson Welles that she started a friendship with. Marlena Dietrich, uh, during these USO tours, would display a terrific sense of humor. Uh, she would uh, be on the stage in front of all these uh, American troops, and she says, I'm going to do my mind reading act. And she points out one soldier who's like staring at her legs and saying, You got to think of something else because I, I can't say what you're thinking about. After the war, Marlena Dietrich would work with really great directors, but she would never really gain the popularity she had in the 1930s. Uh, one of her first post war films was A Foreign Affair made for her old friend Billy Wilder. Now one of the great pairings at this time was Marlena Dietrich with Alfred Hitchcock for the 1950 film Stage Fright. And Stage Fright really doesn't have the greatest reputation, but do catch it. Despite its faults, it really is a thrilling film. Johnny, you love me. Say that you love me. You do love me, don't you? I think he's dead. I'm sure he's dead. I didn't mean it. I didn't mean it. Who's dead? My husband. We had a terrible quarrel about you. Oh, he was vile. You know the sort of things he can say. The female lead of Stage Fright, Jane Wyman, later recalled Marlena Dietrich was like so motherly to me and she would explain what lenses the directors uh, should use on you and what type of lighting and don't settle for anything less. And, of course, her and Hitchcock got along just great. She would then work with her longtime friend Fritz Lang for the 1952 Western Rancho Notorious. It 
there, Frenchy. You can get one of us. Maybe two. But there'll still be three left to settle with her. You've got the odds. Let us clear out and Chuckalock's yours. She's like the first time you're seeing a tough female character in a western. We'd see this later on with Joan Crawford in Johnny Guitar or uh, Barbara Stanwyck in Sam Fuller's 40 Guns. Here she is in 1957's Witness for the Prosecution based on an Agatha Christie novel directed by Billy Wilder. Uh, playing this very tough character that won't fall for Charles Lawton's nonsense. Isn't that more comfortable for you? Oh, Mrs. Vole, this is very important. Over at Universal, Orson Welles is putting together what could have been a trashy crime thriller, but he's making it into this very visually dynamic, engrossing thriller, Touch of Evil. Yes? I told you we were closed. I'm Hank Quinlan. I didn't recognize you. You should lay out those candy bars. Uh, it's either the candy or the hooch. I must say, I wish it was your chili I was getting fat on. Anyway, you're sure looking good. You're a mess, honey. Yeah. Orson Welles' touch is all throughout this film. It seems he's almost directing the newspapers flying by in midair. She'd find it very strange that she returned to Germany in 1960 uh, to give a musical tour, but yet there was protesters that were calling her a traitor, that she left Germany before um, the Nazi, Nazi regime and sort of turned her back on Germany. Uh, there were some bomb threats, apparently, and people screaming, Marlena, go home. But she gave the uh, concert anyway. She did have a meeting with uh, President John F. Kennedy at the time, and apparently Kennedy pulled uh, Marlena Dietrich aside and says, my father told me of all these uh, stories about the affair he had with you. And No, she said, no, my boy, those are all tall tales. Dietrich would appear on stage through the 60s, 1970s, and she'd make her last film in 1981. She would occasionally give interviews about her very long career, and uh, she just sort of considered her Joseph von Sternberg films to be these sort of light fluff pieces that she had no real regard for. And Marlene Dietrich, in her later years, maintained a kind of eccentric sense of humor. She had an apartment in uh, Central Park West and she would go down to the street and she'd stand there and people would see her and she'd be having a hot dog in one hand and a martini glass in the other hand. <laughs> so this is Glenn Andrea. I hope you enjoyed this talk on Marlena Dietrich and do catch some of her films. They're just some of the most amazing films ever made and have a good day.